course, now is when the time is not going to connect for me. Come on, iPad, please. There we go. Hold on a second. I have a slight issue here. Let's do it again. Yeah. Unplug and then plug in. There we go. Oh, here you go. All right. When all else fails, unplug and plug in. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. This is, you are at the end. This is the Lex lecture. I am all that stands in the way. Um, so I just want to echo the words that Tom just said, thanking everybody. It, it's been a pleasure. Uh, talking to you all, meeting you all. I'm super impressed. I can't deal with more than one Zoom meeting a day. So you dealing with all this, staying engaged, staying with great questions, discussion, coffee break. I'm super impressed. Um, I, you, you are more powerful than me. And of course, thanks to the convener or the organizers and definitely, yeah, the, the local team. If I was relied to run a, a virtual TASI, it would fall apart. So what I want to talk about today uh, is the SMEFT, which yes, every time you think it, I think of Smurf, um, which is, is viewing the standard model as an effective field theory. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have been through SMEFT talks before, but often they involve lots of bar charts with bounds and coefficients. I'm going to avoid this stuff. First of all, I'm writing on this tablet. And second, I never find those bar chart plots particularly. And if you've never seen one, you don't know what I'm talking about, hold on. Uh, so I want to talk about what does it mean for the standard model to be used as an effective theory? How do we think about it as an effective theory by itself, not as a reject of some supersymmetry or other theory that we integrate particles out? Uh, how do we use it? How do we use it correctly? Um, and um, what's left to do? Because this is, uh, as I hope to convey to you, I mean, this is not a done deal. This is still something that's very much a work in progress. If you're interested, there's plenty of cool opportunities to work on. So. Let's get started. So we've seen this a thousand, well, maybe not a thousand times, but several times. I'm gonna take the standard model. And when I say SMEFT, all I'm gonna do is say extend it by all possible higher dimensional operators. That is what I mean by the SMEFT. Now all possible, we're not going crazy here. We still want Lorentz invariance and in all of our operators, and we want gauge invariance. So uh, I'm not writing down any operators that are crazy, violate SU3, SU2, U1 kind of thing, but I'm gonna just start down writing them down. So we've seen our first power is gonna be dimension five, then there's six, seven, eight, nine, 10, et cetera. And we don't know the theory that matches onto this. If you have your pet favorite UV theory, you can go work it out. How does it match onto this using the techniques that we've talked about? but I'm not gonna view this as uh, the low energy anything. I want to talk about ground up kind of work. So first just, you know, when would you use this? I, the assumption going into this approach is that BSM states are heavy. So heavy that I'm imagining I'm not making them on shell, the LHC, or I'm barely making them on shell. I would barely mean not very often. So not all physics falls into this category. So if you pick your favorite solar axion model motivated by whatever, uh, it's not in this framework. Right? So this is saying I've got UV physics that's heavy. And we've searched a lot for UV physics at the LHC, sort of TV scale stuff. And we've all seen these plots with the bars sliding to heavier, heavier stuff. Heavier and heavier limits means we're in really in a scenario where V, you know, electroweak scale over M heavy is small. That is an underlying assumption in all this approach. Say, hey, wait, I wanna do this, but I wanna include my axion. Sure, no problem, you can do that. But that's not true SMEF, right? It's just a modification of what we're talking about. So I'm not gonna add any light stuff. I'm not gonna add any dark matter stuff, which is certainly something you could do and continue going with this. All right, you know, why would you do this? Ah, I, I always got to think of questions here. I, well, if I want to hunt for each UV scenario one by one, that's time consuming. 
here's my favorite supersymmetry model with this spectrum. LHC searches, all right, cross that one off. Here's a different LHC, or here's a different SUSY model with this other spectrum. Search, cross it off, et cetera. This allows you to search for a whole bunch of things at once, because you're not searching for a particular model, you're searching for these you know, coefficients of higher dimensional operators. So it allows the study of many UV theories at one time. It still shows us correlations among observables. Because if we see a deviation at the LHC, meaning something that doesn't agree with a prediction, well, first, we're just going to open champagne and have a great time because we haven't seen that yet. Um, but once we do that, the next question is going to be, all right, if we've seen something in you know, observable X, where else do I have to look? And if I know how all of those observables are connected, because I know how each of the operators go into observable A, observable B, observable C, I have a map to tell me where to do it. I see a bump or an excess here. I go look for a bump and an excess there. So this provides some map in order to translate LHC data. LHC data, it does not restrict it to LHC data, but that's sort of where I'm focusing. All right, and the ultimate goal, now is part of why, is we want to get lambda. I want to know where the new physics scale is. I'm not making those particles, I, I'm infer, I, I had to infer from their impact to higher dimensional operators what that scale is. So we can draw a little cartoon here. The idea is that I'm going to have some collider variable. Really, it would be a whole huge set of variables, as we would see, or set of measurements. We'd have here's our standard model prediction. We would say, all right, I see this, some deviation in the data and it stands up and it's not a statistical anything and we're all happily drinking champagne. We want to go from here to tell me what is the mass scale of new physics? All right, so we're doing things with a bottom up EFT. Top down EFT, what we focused on the first few lectures, I knew it went in and I was using EFT to make computations more effective, to tackle one scale at a time. For bottom up, the goal is figure out this thing. And you want to be accurate. So it is important meaning I don't want lambda within an order of magnitude. I said in very simple words that I like to to think about this is here while I put next collider. You want to know that well. You don't want to say, oh, it's probably around 5 TV, build your collider to see 5 TV particles, and then figure out once you did things correctly, it was really 7 TV. Right? So it is important to be accurate here. This is where the EFT framework and its systematic improvability really helps, or it allows you to do this kind of thing. Right? You could you know, say, all right, well, how do I even know there's going to be an next collider fright? We're not answering that question. The idea is, in order to even motivate why we have to build something new, I've got to get a great handle on this. What is the scale of new physics? Higgs was easy in some sense. We knew we had to see something, either it had to be a particle or it had to be new strong dynamics, right? We don't know what the scale is next. This is a way of sort of leading to a roadmap of this. So this is my ultimate goal. There's a lot of things that you can do that look EFT-like that are you know, nice and fun and good little studies, but they are not getting at this ultimate goal. Right? And I'll sort of say exactly why I mean that. In order to do this, you need a global approach. I'll say what that means and try to convince you of that over the course of talking right now. All right, so that's just a little bit about this, who, what, where, when, why, who, us, when, why, ultimate goal. All right, how are you going to do this? Well, you need the operators. The operators we know are organized 
by their mass dimension. So we can start to think, what are the operators at a given mass dimension? So if I do first order is, or first extension is dimension five. You know this, you probably saw this a dozen times in earlier lectures, there's one operator. That guy, right? This is Majorana neutrino mass. And as such, this violates lepton number. We all know. So we would say, well, one is a little bit boring. And we know lepton number is a really good accidental symmetry of the standard model. What, what, do you, what else you got? Give me something that doesn't violate lepton number. So you go to dimension six. This is the first order where you don't automatically have No automatic L violation, B violation. I, because of this, this is usually the first order that people focus on. They say, let me imagine my UV physics preserves lepton number and baryon number. The UV physics preserves lepton number and baryon number, then the EFT we get from integrating it out also will. So under that assumption, oh, pardon me, I don't have the chat on, so if you Good, not yet. Uh, so under that assumption that UV physics respects lepton number, baryon number, just because we have such good tests of that from non-collidery measurements, we often focus on this as the lowest order effect. Keep going. Dimension seven. Actually, you can go dimension seven, nine, 11, you know, all odd dimensions. All operators violate L or B. We can show this, uh, same with all the other notes. References I don't have, I'll, I will add them right before I add, upload notes. So if we have this sort of prejudice or bias that UV physics respects lepton number, respects baryon number, I'm gonna ignore these. So then my lowest order is this dimension six. Next lowest order is dimension eight. Again, there's no automatic baryon number or a lepton number there, uh, but we can see that the number, and we'll talk about the numbers uh, in a second, escalates. This has roughly 10 times the operators. So when we were doing our toy EFTs, it was great. I had one or two at dimension six, one or two at dimension eight, and now we're quickly escalating. And as we saw when I'm doing a bottom up, I am, don't have a matching for any of those coefficients. I have to get them by measuring things. So more operators entering, meaning more measurements are needed to pin down a theory. An interesting, uh, a fun point that I just have to point out is this problem of how many operators, this is operators contained of, you know, made up of our usual standard model fields and derivatives. So how many operators containing this exist at a given order? All right. What if I want dimension 20? Ah. You can do that. This problem, a fun thing that I was part of working on, this is completely solved. Now, just knowing the number of operators isn't super important for phenomenology all by itself, but it is amazing to me that you can solve it and there's some fun things you can do with it. So, before jumping in and showing you some operators, we have to remind us about some stuff about them. First of all, is that we know that there are, uh, I'll just write it as integration by parts and equation of motion redundancies. These are things that we explored at the beginning of uh, lecture two and the end of lecture one. Those are still present. And what we saw to completely solve for the standard model, it is completely solve any possible, I don't know, um, non-relativistic, relativistic, linear representations of symmetries, non-linear representations of symmetries, gravity, all can solve. 
Um, so I don't know what you're imagining by any possible QFT, but most of the ones that I can imagine. But uh, yeah, still interesting. Uh, we have these redundancies, right? And what did I jump up and down or you know, bounce up and down in my chair here saying when we introduced these? That that means you can't ever get too attached to a particular term in your Lagrangian because I could always do one of those. I could swap it out using equations of motion, put in a term that used to have, you know, masses in terms of one with derivatives or vice versa. So that means there's no particular one better than the other set of the operators. I can write them down, but I could always shuffle them around. So in order to make any progress, you have to choose a basis. You have to choose a set of your operators and just say, I'm going to work with this guy. This is the result of manipulating and writing things down, of integrating by parts and using equations of motion. So I'm going to work on a particular basis, but it is super important to remember I've chosen a particular basis, right? We saw basis choice back when we were doing simpler theories, but it wasn't as big a deal because there was only a handful of operators. It is a bigger deal here. Uh, the particular basis we're going to choose is just called the Warsaw basis because it was written down by a bunch of Polish phys physicists. Basically, they were revisiting some physics from the 80s. I'm going to show it to you in a second. In the end, your number that you're getting for a calculation can't depend on your basis, provided you've used the complete basis. Huh? People get into huge fights because people get one number, people get another number. It turns out set A of people is using one basis that B of people is using one ba a second basis, but they're not using the same a full basis. Right? You have to include all of the operators, otherwise you're going to make a mistake. Can this quick increase in number of operators break perturbity of Wilson coefficients? So that's the number of operators. Uh, we know um, that we still have a power counting, which is essentially P over lambda. So they, there's a lot of more dimension eight operators, but they are suppressed by more powers of P over lambda. But that's not a complete answer to your question. I don't honestly know the answer to that question. And I think people are, are, we are, people are actively working on, wait, if this number just totally blows up, can we have any control? So that's a good question. I don't know the answer completely. All right, so unless we've got any other questions, we've got Say I've got to pick a basis, just our sort of set of coordinates that we're going to explore theory space in. Now we have to go through them. We're not going to go through them in terrible detail. I just want you to get some familiarity with them. So they're written on a different slide. Here we go. I should even, I totally forgot to write down the reference of this Warsaw basis. Look, this is the last lecture of the last day. I'm not to, or hoping to torture you with coefficients and fields, but I just wanted to get you to have some feel for what's included in extensions beyond the standard model once I let anything go. At right, dimension six, you can group things by whether they're all bosons, two fermions and a bunch of bosons, right? Can't have one fermion or four fermions. Right, so this is how they're roughly categorized. Right, we've got some class here. These are all bosons, bosons, boson only. All right, phi here is the Higgs field. And we've got some with that have two fermions and a boson. Right, so these are two Higgses or three Higgses and two bosons, etc. These are grouped this way. You go to an EF, a SMEFT conference. People are constantly speaking in some weird code. Um, so one thing that we've got to note here is you might have noticed these little P's and R's there. Those are flavor indices, right? Because I could say this is a lepton from the first generation with a lepton from the third generation, et cetera. If I'm being completely general, I've got to include that. All right. We also see that, you know, all right, there are some operators that are still CP odd. All right. Again, you know, CP is very good symmetry, standard model, oh, very good symmetry, all right? Once I'm going beyond that, I, I, I have to uh, 
the A here. Sorry, that's written down right there. All right. Again, details here. I'm not trying to get you to sort of scramble and write down. I I'm post these notes, of course. Uh, right. We have you know products of SU2 doublets could get me a singlet or it could get me a triplet. So something like this guy is an SU2 triplet current. Uh, they do. Absolutely. There is something called the new SMEFT that takes this, staples in a right-handed neutrino. There is something called, I believe people do this with axions as well. So yeah, like I was saying, I'm just going to focus on vanilla SMEFT, but the techniques that I'm talking about here, you can easily extend. Right? The list of operators is going to get bigger, but uh, with that procedure that I said that you can solve all operators of all dimensions, you can include whatever you want. So these are bosonic for fermion. Here are the four fermion operators, right? I have to worry about, do I have all left-handed fermions, all right-handed fermions, left-handed, left-handed, right-handed, right-handed. Uh, when I introduced dimension six, I said, it wasn't that they all buy a baryon number or a lepton number. There are certainly some that do, right? What's true is just that they, there is a subset that don't. So since I'm ignoring things like dimension five, someone also presented this SMEFT in one of the student talks. Absolutely, Warsaw basis is something that's driven home. So good, I'm glad. Oh, the SMEFT. I don't know what the SMEFT is, but uh, is that the new SMEFT? So I'm just gonna ignore these guys because we already said, I'm forgetting other stuff that violates things like baryon number and lepton number from dimension five or seven. So we don't need to focus on these. Let's see, again, PERST, those are flavor indices. So if we start to do some counting, you would naively say that this is, uh, each of these operators translates to NF to the fourth operators if I just let total flavor chaos go in. So any combination of one, 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 two, one, one, three, four, three, four, one, one, three, one, et cetera. When I do all combinations, that's gonna be NF to the fourth. You know, that's, you know, 81. So if I let all flavor combinations go, each of these lines is, is 81. It's not quite 81. Some rules come in that I have to deal with Fermi statistics if I start repeating generations. But uh, it's a lot. So we're going to get used to this. We'll revisit some of the ones that I talk about more uh, in for more emphasis in a little bit. But we can see that complexity ramps up. If I forget the baryon number violating guys, you'll see that there are, oops, I'm secretly typing. Uh, there's 28. Bosonic CP even. There's six. Bosonic CP odd. And there's 25 plus. Uh, 25 for fermion. This is bosonic, means all bosons are bosons plus two fermions. Do some math 59. These are just the structures. Meaning I count this as one, two, three, not 81, 81, 81. Right? If I let flavor go nuts, sprinkle flavor indices wherever I want. This becomes 2,499. So this is way more complicated than our simple toy EFT. If I restrict what's usually called NF equals one, usually that just means that stuff is universal. So I have a term that looks like QI, uh, gamma mu QI. Uh, let's say it's you know EJ, gamma mu EJ. Right, so that these indexes have to be the same, these indices have to be the same. This is uh, restricts the number back down to about 80. 
but it's still super, super high. Right? Remember, each of those things, if I don't know what the UV theory is, I've got to determine from measuring. Right? So this means I have to have 80 measurements. I don't need to just have 80 measurements. I have to have 80 good measurements. I have to have 80 independent measurements. All right. So whichever way you take it, this number or this number seems totally huge. Right? Did we just invent the SMIF because we wanted to have thousands of parameters? No. Right? At this point, you could, and it is totally understandable. Some people just say, you know, too complicated. I have to give up. Right? We're never going to understand that. Uh, and I would take the approach that no, we can make some be smart, both on the theory side and the experiment side, and we can do this. It's a, it takes a global approach, and I'll just sort of explain how and what that means. But for now, let's just sort of see what's going on with these operators. Now that we've had a little bit of introduction to who they are, we can see what's going on. A complication. Right? We did stuff with toy theories in the, the first couple of lectures. A complication that we have here that we did not have there is that one of our fields, namely the Higgs, gets a VEV. So this means that we really have two scales in the infrared theory. So we really have P over lambda. That's what we had before. That was our power counting. But now we can also have B over lambda. Right? So we've got double expansion here. I've got some operators which are going to give me stuff that's V over lambda and stuff that's P over lambda. So let's just do this out. Right? So far, when we were doing top-down stuff, we had always talked about mapping at amplitude levels. Well, cross sections are amplitude squared. So let's take standard model plus dimension six and square it and see what we get. So I have a standard model plus I'm going to have a dimension six. This is just contribution to an amplitude from a dimension six piece. And we know power counting for a dimension six is V of one over lambda squared. So there's a V over lambda squared possibility. And there's also a S or P squared over lambda squared possibility. All right, I gotta be amplitude's Lorentz invariant. I'm not gonna have just a P floating around, right? So I can have V squared or P squared, which I'm gonna call F. Right? So I have this and I want, so this is a total, a total squared. Well, that's gonna be a standard model squared plus twice the real part, a standard model star, a six v squared over lambda squared plus a six prime s over lambda squared plus one over lambda to the fourth, a six v squared plus a six prime s squared. So the whole idea behind treating this as an effective theory is that we're imagining V over lambda or S over lambda is small. Right? This is power counting expansion. So this term should be the most important one. It has the fewest powers of that heavy scale lambda. This is clearly the interference piece, right? It depends on one factor of the standard model and one factor of the dimension six stuff. So this interference piece is usually dominant. What I mean by dominant is, is usually it's the most important new physics effect, new physics effect. And we see that this is proportional to V squared over lambda squared or S over lambda squared. This one on the other hand is called new physics squared. We'll return to that term. If V and S over lambda are always small, this is going to be small compared to interference. But we will return to that uh, towards the end. Okay, why is this interesting? What does this get us? Well, in 
interesting thing that we can spot right away is we've got this piece which grows with energy, right? S in the numerator there. The LHC is a great machine for making things with high energy. Okay? So because there are, as always, there's nothing special about the S, the SMEF for this, because there are terms that grow with S, it makes us think, staring at this with a giant atom smasher in my pocket, hey, let me take this, let me look at some processes at the LHC with large S, that will make S over lambda bigger than V over lambda, and I can pick it out some effects that I couldn't, be, couldn't get if I was restricted to only this type of term. The LHC brings that kind of angle to this game, right? Because I could have written down this theory and gone and looked at a much lower energy collider. The LHC is bringing here is more access to these S over lambda squared pieces. Because this is stuck at whatever V is, whatever lambda is. Lambda is 10 TV, V over lambda is super small. But if lambda is 10 TV and I can go to an LHC and look at 3 TV, I can make this more important. And I can get some way of feeling out the new physics that I couldn't have here. This is a temptation. And this is a great thing about the SMEF at LHC. It's also what makes it super dangerous and easy to get out of control. Uh, it makes it sound like, um, you know, teenage driver, but uh, in some sense it might be. So uh, keep this in mind, we'll return to that and how that plays a role later. All right, how are we doing? Okay, we've introduced our operators. We said there's a ton. Is A6 coming from dimension eight operators that happen to take the VEV? No, dimension eight operators would be suppressed by one over lambda to the four. So dimension eight is a good point. If I have dimension eight, that's one over lambda to the fourth, just by analysis. And the numerator here could be B to the fourth, V squared S or S squared. So, it is important, and we'll return to this, that my, uh, no. I mean, you have rough limits, and we'll talk about this limits shortly, and why it's complicated to have a yes or no question to that, answer to that kind of thing. So going to the previous question, yes, it is important to point out that dimension six squared is the same order as dimension eight. If we're in this region, where the one over lambda to the fourth effects are small, then it doesn't matter because this guy is small as is this. But as we'll see, this is not always the case. Okay, we've sort of sketched out how things show up in cross sections. We've introduced our operators. We've seen this complication. Let's go a little bit more through that complication. So I would call this what do the operators do? What do I mean by this? When we were in our toy effective field theories, higher dimensional operator was just a new interaction, you know, phi to the sixth or um, psi bar psi squared. That was just a new interaction. The only thing a higher dimensional term did was give me a new interaction. Now that things can have a VEV, this makes life more complicated. We'll see that operators can do multiple things. Uh, like I've told you, my brain only works by example. So let's go a couple of examples. There's an operator, its name, totally irrelevant. Uh, looks like this. All right, so here we've got our little sort of backwards forwards derivative thing to make it Hermitian. We've got Qs. Yes, I'm being totally sloppy and using gammas, even though they're just, they're just uh, left-handed fields. Right. What we want to do is we want to plug in H and expand around its VEV. We're not going to do this in equations. I'm going to do it in pictures. So clearly I could have a term with two. They're going to be two quark terms could be a Higgs boson, and there could be another Higgs coming from here with a derivative on a Higgs. There could be 
two quarks. There's got to be two quarks. There could be a Higgs here, and there could be a gauge boson coming from this covariant derivative. There can be two quarks, a Higgs, a gauge boson, and a second Higgs. I'm picking the gauge boson out there, but keeping that Higgs, keeping this Higgs. So these are all possible new vertices. But also included, this new vertices would look something like Q, mu Q, Z mu H, even H squared, if you'd like. Uh, but this same operator, in addition to making new and exciting um, operators, which you might think, awesome, let's go look for that thing. How many times do I have a quark that talks to two Higgses and a Z? Let's go find it. Well, that same operator, we can think about setting both of these Higgses to their VEVs here. That's what's going to give us correction to how quarks talk to the Z boson. So this also affects that. All right. So we've got these weird relationships among operators. I could go and measure this cool new interaction here, but Whatever I do here, we know that those same effects would have to show up in how quarks shift in their coupling from the Z. So this is shifts or affects Z coupling to quarks. Second example, even more devious, an operator like this. Higgs, Higgs, WW. Again, do the same thing, start expanding around, you will find terms that look like two Higgses and two Ws. You'll find one Higgs and two W. All right, just expanding this thing out. Interestingly here in this term, actually it's not even in this term. When I look at this term and I start to spit in or plug in Feynman rules, let's call this P1 and P2, we find that the, the vertex we got out of here is little h, the boson here, w mu nu, w mu nu. So that has a different Lorentz structure than the standard model vertex, which is just h mu h w w. So even though it's got the same particles involved, extra indices there are gonna mean extra derivatives going around. So we can have similar looking graphs, but different Lorentz structure. Yet another thing that can show up. Well, what happens if I set both Higgses in this to VEV? I can also have just this guy. I can say this is a VEV. I don't like that notation. Let's just say we've got our WW, and then it's just a VEV too. So we've got V squared, W, W. Well, terms that are in the quadratic in those fields, this is the kinetic term. So this is a contribution to the kinetic term. So if I take this kind of piece, let's call this operator CHW, because that's what it's built in my brain to be called. That means if I take this and I incorporate it, and I rewrite into the normal kinetic term, I'd have minus a fourth, one minus two CHW V squared over lambda squared times W mu nu, W mu nu. Right. So I have these higher dimensional operators. I know Higgs gets a VEV. Contribution is that it's not just giving me new vertices, not just giving me the same vertices with new structures, but also it's leaking in to my dimension four terms. This makes life very complicated. Right? How would I deal with this? Well, I've got a non-canonical term, right? The way we would deal with this is you would just redefine W to be W over one minus two CHW V squared over lambda squared. But I've got to do that throughout. Exactly, renormalize or yes, renormalize the W field or yeah, to absorb this. But that means this annoying factor is gonna go through everywhere. Specifically, if I go look at now the Higgs kinetic term, which is what sets the mass for the Ws and the Zs, 
Well, this is going to be, and let's just look at the neutral part, right? I'm going to have g squared plus 1 plus 2 chw v squared lambda squared g prime squared minus g g prime 1 plus chw v squared lambda squared 1 plus chw g squared lambda squared. It affects the gauge boson mass matrix. Gauge boson mass matrix is what determines sine theta. So I've now messed with, yes, you can interpret that as changing the G coupling everywhere as well. That's right. right. And we're going to talk about this in a second. So this is leaked into things like mixing angles. It's also going to leak into the eigenvalue. So GZ with the presence of this kind of term is now shifted. And as we learned from Professor Freitas, right? He's a stand-up comedian. He's a very hilarious human being. Uh, as we learned from him, things like the W and the electric charge, which is G times the sine of this angle, that's what helps define the electroweak theory. We have just messed with that. So these higher dimensional operators, ones like this, can change of things like G, G prime, and V to experiment. If you work this out and you carry through diagonalizing this matrix, finding the eigenvalue, finding what is the equivalent of E, the coupling of fermions to a photon, all in the presence of this operator, you're going to find that E is G, G prime over, that's what we would expect, but it's shifted. So if I can go and measure alpha and say, I'm going to use that to define G, I'm going to get a different answer now. It's now going to depend on this. Mz squared is G squared plus G prime squared. Usually, as, as Iris probably told you, you use things like alpha and Mz to define G and G prime. We can no longer do that now. Meaning if I do G and G prime and I solve these two equations for them, I'm not gonna find that these are inputs of just alpha and MZ alone, which are just measured numbers. I'm going to find that instead G, G and G prime are now functions of CHW. So everywhere that G appears in any interaction with the G, it's dragging around dependence on that CHW. So even if I'm looking at a process with no Ws, if it somehow still has Gs in it, right, it's going to be dragging this thing around. Similar with some other operators. So there are other operators that also affect these, these uh, kinetic terms. So this is why it gets complicated because operators can contribute to multiple processes. It's not that this is only the coefficient of HHVV. It leaks in whenever there's a G. So this means I might look at some effect and it's not affected by just one terminal Lagrangian. It's affected by a bunch of things because of this underlie of how the parameters leak into the dimension four and less. And you can go through this with a bunch of other operators if you like and work out a lot of their consequences. So now we can ask, how do we use this? It is tempting to just look at particularly scary looking operators and focus only on their coefficients. What I mean here is by something that looks like it would have a big effect. A classic one is this guy, CHD, H dagger, D mu H squared. If you plug in the VEVs for that, 
That contributes to the mass of the Z, but not to the mass of the W. And there's a very well-established relationship between those two. If you put in this, it looks like it's going to break that relationship. So you might say, let me look at some theories and anything where CHD is big, kill it. CHD, I don't know if Iris talked about this, but this is what people often used to talk about as ET parameter. And people made planes of the T parameter. And they said, this is excluded, this is not. That's done by looking at a single coefficient in the Lagrangian, right? They're making those judgment calls based on that. That's tempting to do. Another common way that you can use the SMEFT or misuse, I'm gonna claim in a second, this is a misuse, is to say, hey, I designed this super cool collider analysis and it's designed to look for, you know, three Higgs bosons and two Ws. So this one operator is gonna get really excluded. That's true, it, or it, that's a nice thing to do. It's a nice benchmark or it's a nice straw man for your, mo for your analysis, but it's not a real thing. What do I mean by that? Is what we have to remember is that L, the Lagrangian parameters are not observables. So we should never be attached to a single coefficient. Even if it's a coefficient of something, hey, we say, oh, that's super scary. Or it's a coefficient of some operator that looks cool for my collider analysis. We know I can always do a field redefinition, equations of motion, integration by parts, and even remove that one operator that you cared about, right? So the right thing to do with the SMEFT is to always calculate observables. And this hasn't always been done. Uh, and this is sort of a sociological thing because you take a bunch of people like me who are trained as collider physicists, you say here, and we go, oh, that operator looks cool. Analysis to bound that operator. Uh, we're trained with here's some super partner, here's some composite Higgs state, et cetera. You can't do that here, right? Always have to focus on the observables. This is not something that's obvious. The community forgets this, remembers this. They're giant arguments, and most of the arguments come down to the fact that people are arguing about Lagrangian terms, not observables. For example, if I really care about relationship with the MW and the MZ, I can go and measure the rho parameter, which I'm going to get wrong. Observables, these are masses, widths, rates. Right? I can measure MW. How? It's not easy. I can measure MZ, a little bit easier. Cosine theta, this is secretly a mix of alpha, MZ, and G Fermi. And I can go and predict this. Right? I can measure this, measure this, measure this, and I can get what comes out. What comes out is one plus V squared over lambda squared. And the important, th and there's some prefactors in here, but it certainly depends on CHD, but it will also depend on, I'm not even gonna write the numbers. It also depends on, there's a little bit of dependence on this CHWB. And it's a different number, CHL3. And yet even a fourth number, C12. The reason I'm not getting into any detail here is because it's my point is not this particular operator, this particular operator, this particular operator. It is that once I calculate an observable, I got more stuff that's going on. So I can't make a judgment call based on this coefficient alone because the combination that appears in something that I actually measure has got more. So even if CHD is zero, I could have these other parameters make rho not equal to one or I could have CHD not equal to zero. And these guys can compensate. So look at observables. You learn one thing. Why can't you measure the cross section? Well, which cross section would you like to measure that only depends on CHWB? Right, we are going to be doing that. Well, there's a lot of cross sections and they don't just depend on CHB. They're gonna depend on similar combinations of all of these things. But that's the process that we're going through. Eventually we are going to be able to do this, but that's why I say we have to do a global thing. I can't, you're actually, your very good question is leading me right to the point. Based on measuring that alone, I can't say anything. But if I measure this 
plus some things that help me nail down CHWB, CHL3, C12, then I can start to say things. That's why I say we need a global approach. I have to approach this problem by looking at all of the constraints on my theory. I don't fall temptation to looking at just one term. But yes, sorry, I misinterpreted your question. You are exactly thinking the same point that I'm slowly getting towards. Right. So you would think in face of this, look, observables are depending on a ton of things. We saw that I've got these operators that leak into dimension four Lagrangian and show up everywhere. This is another one of those. Right. I've got that I can't just pick out a coefficient. I've got to look at observables. So you might even ask, you know, is SMEF too complicated? given that I've got to measure a ton of things in order to be doing everything. 50 things, 80 things, 2000 things, depending on what assumptions I make. I would say the answer is no. It can be simplified with some smart theory and experiment um, techniques. Techniques is kind of the wrong word, but uh, we'll get to what I mean here. On the theory side, we can reduce operators with some assumption. But we have to make sure that, that assumption is safe. Safe assumptions are something like saying there's a CP conserving. There's a flavor symmetry. Unsafe. This is just consider subsets. Yes, this is only a subset. What do I mean by a subset? To be safe or unsafe, it has to be preserved by these field redefinitions. Something like CP conserving. If I pick only CP conserving, then I plug in all possible field redefinitions, I'm not gonna get a, field, a CP odd term. If I enforce U3 flavor, or the flavor symmetry, and I go through all possible field redefinitions, right? remember field redefinitions, you have to keep the quantum numbers of the field, uh, you're not going to violate this. However, if I was to say CHD is zero, well, that's not something that's preserved under field redefinitions because I can certainly regenerate that. So that's why I mean by subsets. This really means, come on. So that arbitrary uh, really, that's a good question, just for simplicity. It's a good question. There's no reason just to make the analysis simpler. And in general, people do include it, CP violation. So that's from the theory side. What can you do from the experimental side? And really it's the phenomenological side, it's not the experimental side. It's, uh, so from the phenomenological side, you can exploit interference and narrow widths. What do I mean by this? A great place to start if I want to bound operators is at this experiment, LEP. All right, energy is right at the Z mass. All right, my standard model was essentially just this, where this is the Z. We're making the energy so close to that mass that it's really just totally dominated by the resonance here. All right, obviously this is EE to FF. So what are the kind of things if I want to look at LEP in the context of SMEFT? Well, my total amplitude, I'm gonna have the standard model. Plus I could have SMEFT pieces where, as we just saw, the E plus E minus Z coupling is modified. I could have some where E plus E minus is the same but the Z coupling to whatever outgoing fermions I make is modified. 
and I could have this, right? There are four fermion terms that I listed. I could have in general all four of those. Hidden in here, there's actually two types of vertex. Uh, also, we know that the you know normal inputs, how the Z is defined, as we just talked about, that will leak into this map piece too. There's actually two types of fermion, fermion vector corrections that we could get. I could get a term that looks like fermion left, left, or right, right, Z mu. That's coming from, say, the example operator that we looked at. Or I could get F left, right, sigma mu nu, F right, left, Z mu nu. Right? Left, this is left, 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 right. This is what kind of looks like a magnetic moment operator. Well, since the most important piece of this amplitude squared is the interference between this stuff and this, that's going to kill this piece. Because in the standard model, we know the Z always couples the fields with the same chirality. It's always couplings of this type. It's never couplings of this type. So if new physics has different helicity structure than standard model, doesn't show up in the interference. Gone. That's what I mean by exploiting the interference. We also know that this standard model, this is a at the Z pole. That means its propagator is essentially one over gamma Z MZ. Because I, you know, S equals MZ squared. So that means this term, this term times this term is gonna have a one over Z gamma from this propagator and a one over Z gamma from that propagator. But if I do the interference of this with the four fermion terms, I only have one power of one over Z gamma, one over this. So if we would calculate this out and we do interference of standard model with say, let's call it any of these FFV modifications Whoops, I want that in the denominator. If I take that and I say, well, how big is the interference of standard model, standard model with four Fermi compared to standard model with either of these terms? You'll find that this is gamma Z MZ over V squared essentially because of the argument that I just gave. This interfering with this has two one over Z gamma or one over width of the Z. Whereas this interfering with this only has one power of one over the width. We do this interference, works out simple calculation. You find that the four Fermi terms are suppressed by basically gamma Z over V. Gamma Z is like two G V. So this is, percent level. So by focusing and looking at resonances, I kill this. If I just said open up the floodgates and said EE -E to FF, there's a whole bunch of junk that can come in there from these four fermion things. Focus on the resonance. I limit this. I eliminate that completely. So this is a great trick. Does not just apply to the Z. Applies to the W. We're just going to rinse and repeat this once we've established this. Applies to the W, applies to the Higgs, applies to the top. They're all narrow particles. You stick to the resonance, you get only a subset of that dimension six leaking in. Right? With these limitations, that whole set, 2,499, oh, I guess we've imposed some flavor symmetry. That whole set of 80 or so gets us down to about 10 operators. There's only about 10 operators that can enter at LEMP. So you compute all their effects and you go through the LEMP observables. I'm sure Professor Freit has talked about a bunch of them. MZ, the width of the Z, branching ratio of Z to hadrons, Z to LL, et cetera. I'm not gonna write them all down because I'm running short of time. 
you calculate them all, you could do a giant fit. Unfortunately, if you do the counting more correctly, there's actually nine observables here. These things not involve not only rates, they also involve forward backward asymmetry. So how many electrons do we make forward versus backward? Any of that we can use, calculate how do those SMEF observables contribute to physical quantity, put this into a giant, you know, chi-squared essentially. We're not going to discuss fits, but you take your observables, you take how they depend on their operators, and you start to do, get some idea of what the constraints are. We can talk about the details of how that's done, but that's boring. Importantly, when we do this, we always get a bound on the Wilson coefficient over lambda squared. I, I don't get a bound separately for C or separately for lambda. This is part of the difficulty of working with, with EFTs from the bottom up. I only get a bound in this, in this combination. What I have to do is given the bound, assume a value for that, and then make sure that it's not too low, that I haven't lied and not included effects that I should have. So we always have to be interpret You have to assume a lambda and then check that it's okay. Meaning that, that that other pieces that I've neglected aren't big compared to this. Once I've nailed down these 10 operators that come from LEP physics, I haven't nailed them down completely. Why? First of all, experiments aren't perfect. So each of them has some error that allows me some wiggle room when I'm doing this fit. Plus, there just aren't enough. So I need to go beyond LEP which is good because we have moved beyond LEP. You can go beyond LEP to LEP2. This is a higher energy machine. This is E plus, E minus to stuff at about 200 GeV. This gets us new processes that we didn't have access before, like making a pair of gauge bosons. I can't do that at MZ, right? And we can go to low energy. There are a bunch of old experiments that are just E plus E minus to FF, go by the name of things like Petra, Tristan, something. These are all, you know, tens of GeV. If I'm doing a low energy experiment, well, then the Z is going to be only a smaller component. Right, so physics that changed how fermions talk to the Z play less of a role here. So I can get a, I can start to bound the four fermion operators doing this. It's not that this physics doesn't enter at all. It does, but I already have some handle on it from left. So this is what we really mean by a global approach. I have to sort of say, I've got these operators that are bounded by these set of experiments. Once I've got some rough idea of the sizes that there are, start to expand, include more experiments, bigger bound, bound in a wider set of things, keep going. And this is all well and good, but in doing this, I have not been able to look at or bound any operator involving gluons. Nobody involved a Higgs, right? And obviously we want that. We're trying to paint a picture or sort of feel out where that scale lambda is. And perhaps the scale lambda comes from stuff that talks primarily to Higgses and colored stuff. This electron positron approach isn't the end. So we want to keep extrapolating. Keep extrapolating. This means obviously going to the LHC. And since we've seen we get a great reduction by looking at the poles of particles, we want to look at Higgs pole observables. What do I mean by this? Sorry, I'm mixing up terms here is look for operators like this, making glue glue to gamma gamma, right? Restricting this to be at the mass of the Higgs starts to kill a whole bunch of contributions from other operators, allows me to only take on a couple of those dimension six rather than drinking from 
I'm a bit confused. And for 10 GV, it's highly suppressed, so we didn't need to compensate for higher luminosity to make where at 10 GV. These experiments took place at 10 GV. They had less luminosity than, say, LHC. So that just means the experimental errors on them are, are, are different. I don't know what you would mean to compensate. All I'm saying is here is this is at a lower energy. So this S hat is very, very small to MZ squared. So physics like this, where I'm saying physics modifies the Z coupling, this yeah, type in, of- I'm sorry, I mean, in lower energy, it seems uh, the, the higher dimensional operator is already highly suppressed, right? So it might not have the imprint. Well, higher dimensional operators can be suppressed by S over lambda squared or V over lambda squared. V is fixed, right? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. right, we're getting focused on a, super, a different subset. Now, Thank you. Which is part of what you know, we're playing these strengths and weaknesses off of the different experiments from each other. Go to Higgs pole. We can then go to top pole, meaning looking at PP to TT bar. I can restrict slightly more complicated to say making sure that those tops are on shell in an effort to, res to restrict things. So this is a well and good program. It is not completely done. Right? It's also not quite as you know, tight and neat as I've, uh, I've um, said it. So let me just sort of first show off how different experiments are accessing different operators. I'll do this very quickly so we can talk about uncertainties just for a minute. All right, so different colors here correspond to different operators and what they're primarily being constrained by. We've got a bunch of stuff that's from LEP. Once I knew this orange set, we could extrapolate. Looking at LEP2 got me some of the purple, right? Things that affected triboson physics. Four fermion interactions. Going to Higgs got me obviously operators with Higgses in them or with types of Higgs interactions that I couldn't do stuff with before. Top physics gets me yet another set. So by taking this approach, gradually including more and more experiments, we're able to get a handle on things. I don't know why I said that. Oh, here are some bounds on couplings, which I'm not very interested in showing you. So let me wrap up in the last few minutes by just saying that the devil is in the details. So why hasn't this paper just been written the end? Basically because things involve uncertainties. There are certainly experimental ones. In order to be a useful constraint, you have to measure something well. And measuring is difficult at a hadron collider, especially. And there's a giant soup of stuff that you're making. And if I want percent level constraints, I have to measure things percent level. Okay. There's also theoretical. Well, if you measure some deviation in the data from the standard model, you better make well sure that you know the standard model because you don't want to claim new physics if it's really just a higher order correction of the standard model. So one of the theoretical correction or errors is just higher order SM processes. If I want to look at Higgs plus jet and say that's a new physics effect and not just something that's coming in with higher QCD, I have had, had calculated high order QCD. I'm not gonna say anything more about that. We've all sort of that intuitive. We're also missing SMEFT effects. What do we mean? Well, we calculated the one over lambda squared, but what about this one over lambda to the fourth? We know that I can have to stick in some numerator and it's possible for those extra either dimension six squared or dimension eight to come as S squared over lambda to the fourth. At LEP, S hat I know, it's MZ. If I'm imagining lambda to be three TV, five TV, 90 GV divided by five TV is pretty small.
I can ignore this stuff. The problem is we're not at LEP anymore. At the LHC, we don't know what S hat is. Right? This is something that I'm sure Professor Shu said in her lectures, right? We're combining protons. We know the proton energy. We don't know what the S hat is. It's not that we don't know, more accurately said is that we sample a whole range. This is of course weighted by PDF. So if I'm doing stuff at the LHC, especially if I want to start looking at say top plus anti-top and getting access to some of those dimension six effects that come in there, I have to really worry that I'm not secretly in a kinematic regime where that's important. And if is not super sol, then in order to do anything accurate, I have to include dimension six squared, right? I have to include an order if it's not super small. Not only do I have to include dimension six squared, I have to figure out the dimension eight stuff, which is, as you said, things are blowing up in complexity. So I'm essentially out of time. What I wanted to say just at the end in presenting this is that there's still lots of work to do on the theory side, trying to figure out what are good observables to isolate different combinations and really paint this picture or get a better idea for where the scale of new physics are. And there's a really important question, part of which is going on as the sort of snow mass, which I don't know how much you're aware of, uh, idea of trying to come up with real ways of answering these questions. How big are those theory uncertainties? So the answer is, the, it, we don't know the answer yet. It is still a work in progress, which is why I think showing you a bar chart about what's going on um isn't particularly useful so those are lots of opportunities in just using smith uh, i'm happy to talk about so there's some other cool uh more formal developments that i'm happy to mention or talk about more either in yeah, in the discussion not that i know much about but i always i just talked here about using the smith from bottom up there's been a whole lot of cool new matching approaches So this is what's new. Cool moving matching approaches. I mentioned this already. This is the covariant derivative expansion. It allows you to use that slick path integral technique that I showed in lecture one, apply it at loop level and really be efficient, much more efficient than doing these diagrams. There's also Smith plus amplitudes. This giant headache, which I've had to jump up and down about Lagrangian is not real. Observe the on-shell amplitude is real. Why not just work with the on-shell amplitude then? And you can draw a map between, uh, between higher dimensional operators and terms and amplitudes. That's very cool. Uh, and there's this also operator counting. So we have one question. We still have some limits, right? I mean, lambda can't be 15 TeV. Uh, yes, it absolutely can. 15 TeV is huge. I was going to say, for, it could be 500 GeV. For in many some operators. senses, it can be 500 GeV, absolutely. Yes. But, uh, so this is why I'm not presenting anything. If you want to, I have some on those sort of backup slides, which I'll sort of all stick in here. we have got some references for the latest limits, but my goal here was not to quote you where the physics has to be according to that, because I think there's still some issues that have to be sorted out. Uh, and to me, those numbers, I'd much rather get across the approach and the, the, the pros and the cons of the approach. So uh, with that, that's all I've really got right now. I would um, just like to iterate, at least from my perspective, and I'm sure everybody else, big thanks, first of all, to all of you sticking with me. Uh, to organizers, obviously, it was a pleasure to be part of this. I enjoyed tossing myself and I've enjoyed being on the other side immensely. Uh, and as Tom mentioned at the very beginning, the local Colorado team has made this uh, super easy compared to and just done tons of work. So thanks to all of you very much. I will be around for a, this discussion in the afternoon. So you can ask questions on whatever you want. And most likely I'll say I don't know the answer, <laughs> but uh, I give it my best shot. It has been a pleasure. Uh, you, congratulations, you have uh, survived Tasi. Uh, and uh, I will see you a little bit later this afternoon. So. I'm, I stick around too for questions if you have. So 
otherwise, see you later. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Um, I think maybe I want to turn over to Ethan for an update on the group photo. Ethan in charge of all things. If Ethan is yeah. connected. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I guess first, while we're saying thanks, I just want to quickly say thank you to all the students. I, I think going into this, we were very nervous about trying to preserve uh, <laughs> the community and the, the interactions that make Tassie what it is. And I, I think you've all done a really fantastic job of staying you know, engaged over this intensive four weeks and asking lots of great questions. So thanks to all of you. Um, we are going to try to do a group photo. Um, so the way this is going to work is we're, we're just going to do it uh, over Zoom in the gallery view. So please come to coffee room E just before 1.30. So we're gonna to try to take it promptly at 1.30 so we can go on to have a coffee break. Um, and you know, wear, your, uh, wear whatever your, your best shirt is, uh, come with your camera ready. Uh, if you don't have a camera or anything like that, um, you, know, you can send us a photo separately and we'll, we'll sort of composite things together. And then I guess I'll, the last thing I'll say is there's, a, there's one more uh, discussion session. So after the coffee break, we have our last discussion. Uh, I put the algorithm in the, the Slack general. All right, sounds great. Um, so, Finally, by, yeah. Heather, Heather, oh, Tom, is back. Heather is back so we can, we can thank the uh, scientific organizers. Okay, we, I, we held off on that until you reappeared. Uh, it was a, it's a wonderful program. I've, I've got all kinds of things to work on. I think everybody else does too. Good. Hey, Ethan, who is my current research advisor for this algorithm? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, we could say most recent, but I think usually the lecturers are exempt from the algorithm. Well, so why, why don't you, why don't you start in M are in this, uh, uh, Joe and I are too close to similar last names. We'll end up in the same if we do anything dumb and alphabetical. Just tell me which room to go to. So you, you start in mu and then we'll, we'll trade you and Joe.